Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation and thank you for attending. My name is Pablo Perez. I am a PhD student at Alta University under the supervision of Professor Tom Backstrom. In this work, we have also collaborated with Professor Stefan Sieg from Alta University too. In this presentation, I will talk about our most recent article that just got accepted for publication in the IEEE Access Journal. The title of this work is Acoustic Fingerprints for Access Management in Ad Hoc Sensor Networks. And as the title says, in this work, we presented a series of methods to generate acoustic fingerprints from audio recordings. These fingerprints can be used for audio-based authentication of mobile devices, such that they will be allowed to collaborate in specific applications. The structure of this presentation is going to be as follows. First, I'm going to give a small introduction to speech interfaces and explain why they are becoming so popular lately. After that, I will explain how wireless acoustic sensor networks can improve the services that our speech interfaces provide. Then, I will explain the privacy concerns that wireless acoustic sensor networks arise when we have multiple devices recording our voice and sharing it amongst them. After that, I will explain how we are planning to deal with these concerns and show previously proposed methods for audio-based device pairing that we will use as, uh, as reference for our proposed methods. After that, I will explain the methods that we are proposing at this work and I will explain the experimental setup in which we are going to test them. Finally, I will, I will explain the, re the, the results on the performance of the methods that we have proposed and we will draw conclusions from them. First of all, what are speech interfaces? Probably most of the people here work one way or another with speech signals and therefore are familiar with speech interfaces. However, to get into the context of this project, we need to understand what speech interfaces are and why they are becoming more and more popular every day. Speech is our main method of communication. We can use our voices to transmit a great amount of different information and that is noticeable in the wide variety of technologies that study the speech signal. It is not surprising then that speech interfaces keep growing in popularity as they allow us to interact with our electronic devices in a natural way. The most common example of speech interface that we can imagine nowadays are virtual assistants like Alexa or Siri, which allow us to interact with an artificial intelligence as if we were talking with another person. But speech interfaces can be found anywhere, where an electronic device uses a microphone and to record our voice. Being our phones another example of a speech interface with a different purpose, in this case, communication. However, who has never forgotten their phone in their bedroom or dropped it in between the cushions of the couch? And then, when you are in the kitchen trying to call Siri to create an alarm for the oven, it does not understand you, or there is not even a response. The problem of speech interfaces nowadays is that the user is tied to the device that provides such interface. A solution to this problem would be to have multiple devices distributed around the area where the interface is going to be used. These devices would collect the audio information of the area and process it jointly to provide the same service. Some companies provide a similar solution. However, they require that all the collaborating devices belong to the same company and are of the same model. But in a world where every person owns at least two or three devices containing a microphone and the ability to process and transmit audio, we could use all these devices to provide such distributed speech interface. Another concept that has gained a great popularity over the last years is the Internet of Things, an idea of having all our electronic devices connected to the same network, sharing the data they collect in order to provide better services. And a similar idea can be considered for audio devices that work in a network, jointly processing the audio recorded by each of them. 
As we have already multiple devices around us that can work with audio signals, they could collaborate with each other to improve the quality of the voice user interfaces that they provide. If multiple microphones capture our voice around us, the one that captured the best quality could transmit the signal to the rest, or they could apply multi-channel audio techniques to increase the quality of a noisy signal. Traditional multi-channel audio processing assumes that all the sensors are located in a static known position. This is not the case if we use multiple devices distributed around us. However, methods have been presented lately which allow the synchronization of devices in different positions around the room. These methods would allow, us, would allow us to use similar methods to multi-channel audio processing to improve the quality of the recorded signals. Not only could they apply multi-channel audio techniques to increase the quality of the recorded signal, but they could also provide a joint voice user interface with broader services than that provided by an individual device. For example, imagine that I am at home and I want to make a phone call. However, my phone did fall between the cushions of the couch, and I can't find it. I would only have to say, call mom, out loud. My other devices would then recognize the command, and as my phone would be part of the network, they would transmit my voice, regardless of the position of the device. However, the idea of a network of devices recording our voice information and sharing it between them raises some privacy concerns. Multiple devices recording audio around us and processing it means that our voice can be shared among all the devices inside the network. And if one of those devices joined the network only to obtain our voice data, they could easily extract it from the information flow. Our voice, as we know, contains a great amount of personal information, not only the content of the current conversation, but also our mood and health condition. Therefore, we need to ensure that the information shared within the network will remain private. And for that reason, we need to find a way to know which devices in the network can be trusted to process our voice. Maybe this is easier to understand with an example. Let's imagine that Alice and Bob are together in a video conference from the same room. Both their mobile phones could record their voice in order to transmit a higher quality signal to the other side of the conference. Therefore, they would be part of the proposed network of devices. At some point, Alice decided, decides to move into her office and closes the door. Bob's phone should then immediately stop being part of the network of devices that process Alice's voice. Any voice information transmitted to Bob's device after this point would entail a violation of Alice's privacy. A measure to define which devices should be allowed in a specific wireless acoustic sensor network could be the distance from the user's device to each of the possible devices in the network. Some file sharing applications like Google Nearby Share or Apple's AirDrop use the device's Bluetooth signal to find devices that are nearby and share files with them. In the case where the shared information is the user's voice, however, physical distance might not be the proper solution. Let's go back to Alice and Bob's office. Even after closing her door, Alice and Bob could still be quite close to each other if they both were next to the door or a common wall. And a similar problem happens if we only consider devices connected to the same Wi-Fi network. As a solution to this problem, we propose to adapt the acceptance or rejection of devices in the network according to how we perceive privacy around us. Adding an extra layer to the authentication that would prevent our devices from sharing private speech information in cases like the one mentioned above. So, according to this, how can we analyze our perception of privacy to protect our private information? In order to protect the user's privacy, we first need to understand how people actually perceive their privacy. In previous studies, we have observed how people perceive different environments and we have tried to analyze how they would behave in different situations. And while it's not easy to quantify a level of privacy for a specific environment, we observe that people do behave differently in different environments.
We have observed that people modify the way they talk, depending on the conditions of the environment. For example, if we want to share a secret with someone, we tend to lower our voices so that it doesn't reach as far. The same happens if there are more people around us and we don't want our voice to reach them, or if we are aware that a potential eavesdropper could be trying to listen to our conversation. Therefore, we propose to use the information of the audio in the environment to recognize which devices are close to us from an acoustic perspective. In order to achieve this, the most suitable solution is to compare the audio recorded by two devices. To compress the information of the audio features and enable a fast and private comparison of the recorded audio, we propose to use acoustic fingerprints. An audio fingerprint is simply a stream of bits that contains compressed information of the recorded audio features. They are very popular, for example, in applications like Music Retrieval. A device records a segment of a song, calculates its fingerprint, and then compares it with a large database of audio fingerprints in order to find a match for the specific song with very high efficiency. In our case, we propose to have both devices record a segment of audio simultaneously. We will calculate then the corresponding fingerprint and we will compare them. If the devices are in the same space, the resulting fingerprints will be similar, resulting in a match and allowing communication between the devices. On the other hand, if the devices are located in different locations, the recorded audio signal will be different, the resulting fingerprints will not match, and the communication will be restricted. The final operation of the proposed authentication system will be then as it is shown in the picture. If Bob wants to connect to nearby devices to form an acoustic sensor network, only the devices that are within the reach of Bob's voice will generate a fingerprint similar enough to be granted permission to collaborate, like Alice's phone. Eve's phone, however, who was trying to eavesdrop on the shared speech signal, will be rejected because she is not within the area reached by Bob's voice and the fingerprint that she will generate will be different than others. Some methods have already used the audio of the environment to authenticate devices. Using a combination of acoustic fingerprints and fuzzy cryptography, they transform the fingerprint into a cryptographic key that can be used to establish communication. Considering that the devices trying to establish the connection are independent from each other and are in different locations, it is possible that the audio information does not arrive to them at the same time <clears throat> and they are also not synchronized to start the recordings. This desynchronization can be fatal for the authentication process and, in order to compensate for it, they use long non-overlapping windows to analyze the signal in the frequency domain. This way, they maintain a high robustness in the authentication method. The drawback of this approach is that, in order to collect enough data to create the fingerprint, the required length of the audio recording is too long, especially for a conversational application where a conversation can take place in a few seconds. For that reason, the methods that we propose in this project aim to reduce the length of the audio recordings while increasing the robustness of the acoustic fingerprints. First of all, we consider that, as the recorded signals will also probably be transmitted, we would reduce the length of the windows and introduce some overlap in order to make them similar to a speech coding application with which it would share different sections of the processing. The final window is the one shown in the picture with 30 milliseconds length and an overlap of 10 milliseconds. As we commented before, using shorter windows produces a significant drop in the quality of the generated fingerprints. Therefore, we propose to apply the correlation methods to the energy spectrum of the signal in order to increase the robustness of the acoustic fingerprints. I won't go much into detail about the decorrelation methods, but I will provide a small overview of their performance. The first method is based on eigenvalue decomposition of the signal's energy spectrum. The second one is based on Wiener filter, and the last one uses a two-dimensional discrete cosine transform. In the picture, we can observe the relationship of some components in a matching scenario after the decorrelation process. 
we can observe that all the values lay on a thin diagonal line. This means that matching components are represented with almost the same values. This will be represented as the same value in the final fingerprint, and they will be considered a match. On the other hand, when we compare the components between two different scenarios, they look like they are randomly distributed. This will be translated as different fingerprints, and the communication will be restricted. Finally, in order to obtain the set of bits that will form the fingerprint, we quantize the decorrelated values depending on the distribution of the components, assigning more bits to the components that contain more useful information. We present two quantization methods based on the individual entropy of the decorrelated component and another one based on the mutual information between matching pairs. Eigenvalue and Wiener methods show a uniform distribution along both time and frequency axes. However, the two-dimensional density compresses the information towards the lowest bands, which results in a bit distribution as it is shown in the pictures, assigning more bits to the lower bands and barely any to the higher ones. Now we will explain the text testing setup for the different proposed methods and their final results. For simplicity and in order to reduce the computational load of the transformations on mobile devices, we propose to use free train transformation matrices for all of the methods, which generalize over the whole training dataset. The audio samples used for training and testing aim to resemble a conversation between two people in different environments, where a voice user interface could be used. The speech samples chosen to create the speaker signals are extracted from the TIMID database, which contains recordings of approximate duration of 3 seconds. We consider these samples suitable for simulating a conversation between two subjects, because they allow us to switch speaker often and obtain a balanced amount of speech from each speaker in each sample. The different environments are chosen from the QUT noise database, which contains noise samples in multiple locations, like a cafe, inside the car, or the kitchen and living room in a house. Also, as each of the rooms have different acoustic properties, we estimated the effect of the different rooms and applied them to the speaker signals for a realistic result. This simulation was performed using the Pi Room Acoustics Library. The simulated scenes were set up as we show in the picture. Two speakers in front of each other with two microphones between them. An extra microphone to record the same signals from farther away and three noise sources that randomly change position over their designated areas to simulate diffuse environmental noise. The final result is a training set containing 12 hours of conversational speech data and a test set that contains 3 hours of speech. As we explained before, the aim of this project is to design acoustic fingerprints that allow audio-based authentication on mobile devices in a short period of time such that they can be used in conversational applications. For that purpose, applying the different methods that we mentioned before, these are the final parameters used for testing the, the different fingerprints. The reference method that we introduced before uses long non-overlapping windows of 0.375 seconds each, and using a total of 17 windows, the final length of the recording is 6.375 seconds. The proposed fingerprints use different number of windows depending on the decorrelation methods. However, all of them use the presented 30 millisecond windows with a 10 millisecond overlap, which can also be explained as a step of 20 milliseconds. The resulting length of the eigenvalue and Wiener methods is 2.17 seconds, while the 2D density based fingerprint uses an audio segment of 2.57 seconds. To allow for an easy comparison between the methods, all of them generate a fingerprint with a length of 512 bits. In this picture, we can observe the final measured robustness results. These results were measured by picking pairs or fingerprints that would be considered matches and evaluating the amount of equal bits that they contain. This similarity value is then represented as a percentage of the total length of the fingerprint. We can observe how the method used as reference 
called delta time frequency, has a median similarity value of 75%. This value is clearly outperformed by the eigenvalue-based decorrelation, and 2D DCT-based fingerprints quantized, both, quantized using both entropy and mutual information methods. Note that, while the eigenvalue-based method shows the best performing results, it was also the method that required the shortest audio segment to be generated. In conclusion, we have presented several audio fingerprint generation methods that can be used for authentication of devices. A combination of short overlapping windows and decorrelation of the energy spectrum of the audio signal provides high robustness values while reducing the length of the required audio recording by a factor of three. Being the eigenvalue decomposition, the method that provided the highest robustness value using the shortest audio segment out of all the proposed methods. The proposed fingerprints also maintain the necessary statistical properties to be used in an authentication process and, additionally, the presented methods do not add a significant computational load to the authentication process. If we consider that parts of this process could be shared with the speech codec working in the device, and the fingerprint calculation can be performed every two seconds, according to the length of the recording, we can conclude that the presented fingerprint methods can be used in mobile devices without compromising their performance or battery life. In future work, we shall analyze the performance of these methods in a fully functional authentication system and investigate how real desynchronization between devices might affect the robustness of the proposed fingerprints. This authentication method could also be paired with other proximity detection methods, like the intensity of the Bluetooth signal, to detect nearby devices with which an acoustic sensor network could be automatically created when other devices are nearby, and would recognize when new devices enter the area to consider a periodic update of the network. And with this, we conclude this presentation. Thank you for your attention, and please don't hesitate to address any questions to me.